hey, good afternoon. Um, I ran across a letter. I wrote this letter when I was in jail. It was a letter. It was a campaign letter. I designed it. It's like four pages. I'm going to read it to y'all. And y'all tell me if somebody should have helped me and got me home. No exaggeration. I mailed this letter out every day to any and every. I'm just going to read it to you. Now you tell me, man, would you have helped me? It said, a wrongfully convicted man, Dr. Alpha Tar Stewart, peace and balance. I'm an innocent man. I've served the last 28 years of my life inside of a cage for a crime I did not commit. On July 10th, 1997, I was arrested for the shooting death of a man I never met. I was given a co-defendant. I ain't going to say his name, but y'all know who he is. He's from Harlem. Who made a video statement implicating me in the crime he was initially arrested for. Same as he did to a dude named Todd Moore. You know, Todd was my boy from Harlem. For early murder he was arrested for. Later on, this same dude wrote out a recantation and confession to the crime of murder that he accused me of. The case was severed. My attorney was Alan P. Haver. He never called this dude to stand at my trial to testify. Once I was convicted, the same dude who did the crime told on me was released without ever going to trial. I was judged for my first crime where, you know, dude who was dating my mother tried to pimp her, forced her into prostitution. She resisted. He beat into a coma. I came home from school, found myself, you know, cornered. This is a grown man. He took, put out a gun on me. You know, he attempted to shoot me. He fought for his gun. He lost his life in a struggle. I didn't intend to kill that man, you know. It was not pre-planned, it just happened. But during the struggle, and the gun went off. He lost his life, I was arrested. I pled guilty to manslaughter at the age of 15 and spent seven years in maximum security prisons. Now, it's another dude, he's dead now, so I can say his name, Huey Phillips. I'm actually happy he's gone, because um, he, he was a two, three-time felony offender. He came forward after being arrested for crimes and still not clear with but he, he brought my name on first what the police did, stayed there, heard gunshots. They didn't see, see me flee the building. And they knew me for seven years or more, which is possible because I, I was upstate for seven years in jail and wasn't home for full 45 days when the crime took place. Another dude, he was arrested for his third narcotic sale. He got like bakeries and, and grocery stores in the Bronx now. But um, I ain't gonna say his name. But he, he went down for some crack, and then he came and he was sent to two to four at the time when the Rockefeller drawers were in full effect. And I don't know how, but he claimed he ain't received no deals with his testimony. And um, the prosecutor, when he arrested the first dude for assault, he had written the court. You know, I wrote the court with the, with the dude's arrest number in order to obtain his plea allocation, sentence him to a pre-sentence report. And the court directed me to write to the district attorney's office because the case against him was never processed or docketed. So I wrote the district attorney's office and ADA FOIA officer, Miss Sarah Hines, stated that the case against him was sealed. And he also testified in my trial under oath and claimed that he never see any type of deal in exchange for his testimony. He also claimed that he was with his cousin at the time of the incident, Octavius Hines. I'll tell you a good dude, shout it out. And they observed the whole incident together. Octavius Harding, his own cousin, took the stand and when the question at my trial stated that his cousin is lying because he's HIV positive and afraid to go to jail due time. Now the next dude, he's Aaron Hall's nephew. They call him E. Kling. I ain't gonna say his real name, but y'all know what I'm talking about. He came forward two and a half years after the crime, stated he had heard gunshots, and he allegedly seen him flee the, flee the victim's building. Man, we have never had beef or nothing. Another dude, a Haitian dude, Leslie Neptune, a legal Haitian immigrant facing deportation. He had a severe crack addiction. He came forward 25 months after the crime, stated that he seen me from a five-story window flee the victim's building after hearing gunshots. Then you got this David Irons character, a gang member of Bloods career criminal serving a sentence of 75 years of life for robbing and terrorizing 19 Holocaust victims, claimed that I 
allegedly confessed to him in jail and that I plotted to frame my co-defendant that was giving it to me for the crime I was convicted of that my co-defendant already committed, already admitted to. And the common experience teaches that even an innocent person who believes that he'll be placed under suspicion may indis- indistinctly protectively result in conduct which might create the appearance of guilt in order to avoid criminal prosecution. But, you know, even so, if if, if, if a slight value stand alone, it'll never be made a basis for finding of guilt, but only use to strengthen other more direct and substantial evidence of guilt. And this day and age, jailhouse informers looking to make bills destroy more lives with lies and deceit than certain diseases. Informers have been falsified in confessions in the United States since at least, like, 1819, at one point in history, jailhouse informers served a good purpose. They helped authorities monitor dangerous organizations like the Ku Klux Klan and the Nazis. As time progressed, however, jail informers began to, they began to, let me see, obfuscate, that's a good word, the truth more than they advanced it. Jailhouse informers, you know, they won't say anything about anyone that they think can help them. The damage jailhouse informers inflict is enormous, and one of the main reasons there's so many incidents, people wrong for the convicted crimes they did not commit. Most simply, informers fabricate confessions by asking other inmates why they're in prison. When the inmate tells the informant about the crime of which they, the police accuse them, the informant repeats the story to police as a confession, conveniently admitting claims of innocence. For example, like, you know, a district attorney in New York County, he accused a dude named Laurel Huffman repeatedly, despite his history as a jail's informant. In Pennsylvania and Arizona, they never called district attorneys in either state to find out. Newsday, on the other hand, tracked this past through readily accessible public records. Prosecutorial use of jailhouse reform is extremely dangerous for two reasons besides the ones already stated. First, it's a substantial con- contributor to convictions of the innocent. And second, it releases a host of unsavory characters back into society. There are no eyewitnesses in this case against me that I, I did all that time for. 911 phone calls made witnesses state that the suspect is 5'10, stocky 220. I'm 5'4 with boots on and about 160, 175. It was a female, she was my girlfriend at the time. Her name was Tasha Kakuda. She testified that I was with her at the time that, you know, the alleged thing happened and that, you know, we had traveled together during that day. When the last incident took place, seeing my sister Tony, who also testified, both made statements to police at the police station on the day of my arrest, identical to my statement made on the day of my arrest to the police at the police station. Neither one of them got criminal records, both were legitimately and gainfully employed. Cross examination by the prosecution was totally unproductive, and the chronology related by them remained unshaken. We had Derek Harris, that's my boy Duck Sauce, we had Rosemary Turner, that's Jamie, Jamos. You know, they stated they had actually seen the person who committed the crime that are not the killer. Further testified that, you know, the, the other two bozos and Aaron Hall bozo, Aaron Hall's nephew, they had known to them, but they grew up with them, and neither of them were anywhere near this Trinity when the incident took place. So it's two people that testified and said, these niggas who ragged on me wasn't even there when this shit happened. It was two of our eyewitnesses who identified someone else as the actual killer in the lineups at the 26th precinct conducted by Detective Serrano. But then in case these witnesses was never disclosed to me, I reached a four I requested and received a DD5 complaint form made by Detective Albert Acevedo. It states that he received two photos of me from my parole officer, Charles Watson, two days after the crime. What's so disturbing about this is that I was paroled to a Paul County, some Manhattan detective who possessed these photos of me a whole month prior to my arrest. Believe it. I, you know, I've written... My trial attorney asked if he ever had knowledge of DD5. If so, why did he not play Detective Alvarez where he was standing and asked, number one, who informed on my existence and why I go to my Bronx Bureau officer to get photographs of me for investigation of Manhattan homicide, what he was doing with these photos of me, who or how many did he show these people, and where are these photos now? My attorney never responded to these questions. The crime scene control sheet says that possible blood samples secured from the crime scene, the medical examiner conduct conducted forensic biology and serology examinations in the sample, and the results were never turned over to me. Two crime investigators, both retired homicide police officers, found five eyewitnesses, um, Kerry Ross, L. Robinson, 
Barbershop Boy, Master John, Jesse Griffith, and Robert Bradley to this crime who stated that, you know, I'm not the killer. I'm just a le- I'm, I'm this person who died. My trial attorney, was, you know, he was made aware of this fact, interviewed these witnesses, and each of them subpoenaed or brought to court. And um, he never put not one of them on the stand. And I was convicted and sentenced to 25 years of life for the killing of this man. And um, while I was in prison, I learned as much as possible about the law. You know, I had a formatted to prove my innocence. I filed every type of motion I could possibly to prove my innocence. I filed a 30 point, a 330.30 motion, 540.10 motions, two 440.20 motions, an Ericorum Novus, a Red Sanctuary, a State Habeas Corpus, a Federal Habeas Corpus, a reargument motion, and a reconsideration motion to every motion. Every single one was denied. I tracked down the eyewitnesses, my attorney never allowed to testify. I received sworn notarized affidavits from them. I filed another 440.10 motion and was denied. I went to the appellate division and was still denied because the court claims that required an affirmation from my trial attorney explaining why he never put these witnesses on the stand to testify. I held my attorney with the request by writing him one letter a week for two years until he finally provided me with the affirmation. I filed another 440 motion and was denied again without a hearing. I appealed to the appellate division. I was denied again by the same court that stated I need the affirmation. And this time with the affirmation, they stated that there is no question of law or fact. I wrote the district attorney, Supreme Court, magistrate, administrative judges, U.S. district attorney, the district attorney of 10 different counties, U.S. and New York State Attorney General, the Integrity Unit, Conviction Review Bureau, 48 congressmen, 62 senators, 150 assemblymen, 80 councilmen, thousands of lawyers, every bar association, legal aid society, prison legal services, exoneration agency, appeals bureau, law school, law library, college, innocent projects, and New York State, even some of the other states as well as other countries. Other countries. Finally, um, law professor Adele Bernhardt on New York Law Innocence Project accepted my case. I've already been in the deepest, darkest corner of hell for over 20 years now. I had signed a contract with her to represent me. I recently received a disturbing letter from her after she had my case for two years, stating that I should move on my life and stop trying to convince people to believe a story that doesn't ring true. Sometimes truth doesn't sound right, just like the cases of Jabbar Collins, David Minter, Marty Tinkler, Derek Hamilton, Fernando Bermudez, Jeffrey Deskin. And yet, because of the per- perseverance fighting these men, they have been exonerated. In the two, in the two years that she had my case, she ain't interviewed not one witness or filed a single motion on my behalf. All I got from her was false hope. And, you know, as, as, as a man of God, I learned to accept anything from anyone, expect anything from anyone, because, you know, the devil was once an angel. Therefore, with, with an inf- 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 infatigable right and discipline, I continue my fight and let the world know about the injustice I'm forced to endure. Now, I've written Nancy, I wrote Nancy Grace, Sarah Wallace, ABC, CBS, NBC, Fox, HBO, Showtime, Prime TV. They were BLS, they were BAI, they were PIX. You know, mail, I was getting my mail. I was going to Ebony Jet, the New Yorker, Times Magazine, New York, Washington Post, Newsweek, Newsday, USA Today, New York Law Journal, Village Voice, NAACP, ACLU, MC's National. I'm a president of the United States, vice president, pardon attorney, justice denied, commission of civil rights, division of human rights, the borough president of Manhattan. New York Civil Liberties Union, churches, Office of Court Administration, Federal Public uh, Defenders, Department of State, Homeland Security, Office of Government Ethics, um, Legal Action Network, Prison Legal News, Lieutenant Governor, the Mayor, Police, Police Commissioner, um, FBI, Internal Affairs, Department of Justice, Mayor's Office to Combat Police Corruption. I even wrote Howard, help me Howard, like Howard Thompson. And I, I was still in the cage suffering. It was like a slave. Like my wrists right now and my ankles, they got permanent rings around them from handcuffs and shackles. I would flex on certain cases and things aren't fair. It wasn't fair for me. Like, for example, Marty Tanklef, he was accused of killing his own mother and father. Witnesses said they saw him do it and he confessed to his crime. But without even having to fight, I put forth. He obtained DNA that proves innocence. Yet my case, DNA's office has the DNA that will prove my innocence. But will not give me the serology or forensic or biology examination results of DNA found at the crime scene. If I was white or if I had money, would I be going through such a fight? I wonder. I lost countless loved ones. 
I was not allowed to go to their funeral wakes. I've been cutting razors and scalpels and stabbing knives and icebergs. Recently, I discovered that the attorney who presented me at trial had 20 felonies, 20 felony convictions, and served three state prison terms before representing me at trial. How is that legal when a lawyer is to be disbarred for just one felony conviction? I've been psychologically tortured, physically beaten, and sexually assaulted by prison guards. I did over eight years in solitary confinement. I'm still standing. I'm still strong. Now, I'm man, I'm broken, but how much more of life could a human take? Is the justice system designed to ensure justice? Or the test of course is mental endurance. We just want to get justice and prayer. Like now, I'm going to tell the story. Now, that's a letter that I sent to everybody. And I'm still in that same fight, just in a free fight. Y'all be joining me in the fight? Listen to the letter. Y'all tell me what y'all think. I need some input. Good night, y'all.